started Make Life Fun podcast because I needed more fun in my life. When I became a mother, I, for some reason, just put on this like high ponytail, mom jeans, and nose to the ground. I wasn't having fun. It wasn't until I started having fun that it started becoming easy. Fun and mental health go hand in hand for me. I've been in this mental health game my whole life. <laughs> and I am so lit up to like help other people. I'm so lit up for other people to experience this because it's what my wish and my mission is for every woman is to find safety within themselves because it took me a long time to get here. Welcome back to Make Life Fun. Today's guest is Stephanie Thompson. She is an author. She is here today to talk to us about authorship and the journey to motherhood. Stephanie and I connected on social media over this topic of writing a book, and I'm so excited for her to be here today. So welcome, Stephanie. I am so excited to be talking with you. It's so amazing. (laughs) Thank you for making the time and the space. I so appreciate it. We connected because one of our, I guess, cohort of Your Turn to Podcast, she said, Josie, you should write a book. And I'm like, (laughs) I'm open. And then you came underneath that and said, I can help you with that. So that is what brought us here today. And I'm just excited for it to unfold however it needs to. I'm so excited too. That's beautiful. So you wrote the book. Did you write the book? The broke There you go. <laughs> the day of Jane broke. <laughs> yes, I did. And it's quite funny because I don't think in my entire life have I ever said the word vagina as much as I have since writing the book. And at the beginning... I used to blush myself and I used to tell my kids it's called the Brave Mama book. But now my daughter's six and she's heard the intro for the podcast. She's like, oh, broken vagina. (laughs) Not even realizing that it's me or that it's my vagina. It's pretty funny. I tell you, and at six, she just doesn't even know any way. So that makes it even more funny because now she's (laughs) safe. And I love that she so actually beautiful. will probably never make the connection that it was from her childbirth, like it was mm. from laboring her. Oh my God. Oh, and that too. Wow. Yeah. Actually, I'll read you the last bit because it's important. And I think it, like as much as we can laugh, right, about how, how attention grabbing the title is, I did it on purpose for a reason, not even really knowing at the time. Because I think if you write the day my pelvic floor broke Ooh. from childbirth, People won't be interested. They'll be like, "Eh, eh, whatever. But I wrote this. I said, and finally for my girl Elsie, writing this book and sharing it with the world demands a level of vulnerability and courage that doesn't come easy. I worry that one day you will read these words and somehow feel responsible for this trauma I experienced during your birth. But I know that if I say nothing, nothing will change. And I'm called to do everything that I can to stop anything like this from happening to you. So I wrote this book for you. Yeah. Oh, that just gave me chills. I just got emotional reading it. I've read it a million times. What the hell? Oh my gosh, that touched my soul. So I'm so driven. Everything I do is to make sure that this doesn't happen to her because we really had no idea about any of this stuff. So and you are being a new mom. I'm not sure what your birthing experiences were like, but now you've got that protective for your son that you'll do anything for mm. him to protect him mm-hmm. right and I didn't so. know how all consuming it was I hadn't like you hear it from other people but until you experience it for yourself yeah. there's just no way to explain it to somebody else and this is what I think this is a whole reason for the podcast Josie is that even though I wrote a book I thought it would change the world just in an instant I thought I could fix a very broken birthing system here in Australia very naively I had good intentions but then I realized well that it didn't change. I'm like, whoa, whoa, nothing happened. What? And so the podcast had to come next so that we could continue these women's health conversations mm-hmm. and ensure that we are working towards things like this not happening. Exactly. And my birthday experience was definitely nothing like what I thought it would be. I, I went in it with the right intention. I went in it knowing that I was made to labor. I was made to birth. Like this is my God given like thing. This is what I was put on this earth to do. So I had every intention of being able to just push my son out and 
have beautiful births. So I labored for over 30 hours before I had to be induced and have a C-section, but there was no learning in all the classes I took and all the books I read. Like there was no learning. Like I found out I had a heart shaped pelvis floor or pelvic bone or something. And so when she put her hand in there, my son's head would not come out. Like it was stuck. So he was like to the side of my body instead of where he needed to be. I didn't even know that was a thing. This is exactly my plight is that exactly the words you just said, the exact words in my book, basically, that I read all the books and I went to, I went and paid for private birthing classes too, thinking I could do this. And can I just say your C-section probably saved your pelvic floor because for Elsie, when she was stuck, they just basically had to rip her out with forceps and that use of forceps tore the um, pelvic floor muscle off the bone, which means that my vagina is broken because all my organs fall down the vaginal canal and live on the outside of my vulva, like in my underpants because they can't hold up anymore. So that's what a broken vagina is. And then there's no surgery to fix it. You just have to live with it. And this is the thing that when I found out that one in two women can have pelvic organ prolapse is what it's called. I was like, what? How do we how do we not know about this? Like we know about women's breast cancer so well with pink ribbons, but how do we not know about this? And this is why I was like, I have to write a book about this. I actually never intended to write a book. I will get to that, but yeah. Wow. There's no yeah. way to fix this. No. So for some women, you can have pelvic floor repair surgery. A lot of women like me, the damage is so extensive, like from the forceps, that you can't reattach the muscles back to the bone. Well, it gets complicated. It's quite complex. They used to use mesh, but I don't know if you've heard in the States in particular, there's a big lawsuit against the use of mesh because it's making it worse for women. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, I think there was a big lawsuit. So yeah, at at this stage, there's nothing. We're waiting for technology. We're waiting for research. Mm, My heart. (laughs) We just yeah, we just live with it. Yeah, and and think about it, right? Before two minutes ago, to look at women, it's invisible. It's an invisible disability that is so debilitating in your life. It's hard to walk. Like it's really hard to walk or stand for longer than ten minutes. No one knows. It's the, like the worst kept secret because everyone just assumes you're normal and you're not. It's horrible. But so many women, like one in two women will experience prolapse in their life. So, wow. That's another thing that you don't hear about. Yeah. yeah. And I did, they did use the forceps in me. After she used the forceps, she put her hand in there too, because he wasn't coming out. It wasn't until his heart rate dropped to the lowest point where it was scary that it was like, they had no choice. Like, If that hadn't happened, they probably would have just kept trying to get him out. Yeah, possibly. And after 30 hours of labor, you would have been so maternally fatigued, even if he did have the right passageway to come out for you to labor him, you probably had no energy left. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't leave it too long. It's ridiculous. Oh my gosh. I'm just getting tingles like all the way up and down my body just because this is something that definitely needs to be talked about. This Mm -hmm. needs to be educated about from like, from before you even are pregnant. Like this needs to be, like you said, it needs like blows me away. And it starts as young as my daughter. So I'm not talking to her about sex education and babies. My God, no, (laughs) but talking to her really simple things like her pelvic floor. She's six. We've already started to say you can't strain when you're on the toilet. Like if she's constipated and she's not eating that great you can't push your poo out because I've learned that before I got to birth, my pelvic floor probably had dysfunction anyway. So it wasn't in its best condition before even trying to labor a baby out because I was an athlete. And so running and doing all of those things and constant constipation as a kid really does affect your pelvic floor. So before I even went into labor, I didn't have the best conditions. So we're already talking to her about that. Like, you know, if you need, And there's different ways, different strategies you can use so that you're not constipated. I do also think that girls need to be taught about their pelvic floor in high school around the same time as their period conversation. So if they're taught about their period, then why not talk about where it lives and how you protect that? Because, you know, as a 40 something year old woman, I was so embarrassed to work out that my vagina and my vulva were not 
the same thing. They're totally different. <laughs> like, how did I not know that? I feel a bit stupid. But so- we're not, it's not something that we're taught. If, unless we go looking for it ourselves, there's no way to know. We're actually taught the wrong anatomy from the very beginning. If you ask anyone, even in our education system, my daughter had to learn about it for, for child protection and they had to label their body parts and they labeled the entire thing vagina. So mm-hmm. they're, being, they're literally being taught that. That's what I thought for the longest time. It wasn't until I was going, I was pregnant that I started looking at these diagrams and started like, I didn't even know what was happening down here or in my belly or any mm-hmm. of it. It was all just like a shock, a surprise, a learning and unfolding during absolutely absolutely but yeah so I wasn't too sure where my podcast was going to go and I thought I was just going to do one season fix the world just like the book and I realized I really love it I'm Mm. not stopping how old are your kiddos six and four oh wow oh gosh yeah Yeah. they are tiny (laughs) I had two under two for a little while that was crazy don't do that Josie do not do that Yeah, I kept telling my husband because I do want another one. And, you know, they they say 35 is knocking. You better do it now. And so I was like, when he's 18 months, that's when I turn. I will be like 36. And so okay. I'm starting to be like, should we do it sooner? So the fact that you just said, don't do it, Josie. Well, okay. So here's the really difference is that I had prolapse with the first one. Trying to care for two kids with prolapse was crazy. Mm. And that was that's the difference. If you don't have it, then I think it's hard. But then now when they're four and six, it's really good because they are they keep each other company, mm. they're really close. So I don't regret. And then, then you've got nappies out of the way altogether. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. And I just think too, because I was I was 37 when I had the second one. So I didn't want to wait too long mm-hmm. if, then if I had infertility issues. So whenever is the right time for you. I'm just going to let God decide that because yeah. that's how it happened with Everett. I mean, <laughs> so when it's supposed to happen, it will happen. Yeah. Well, it helps if your husband's at home too. Being yeah. 14 hours away is hard. <laughs> I'm starting to realize it's, I mean, you make do with whatever situation that you are put into like you just figure it out like if you would have told me I would be staying home with my son all by myself like doing a podcast doing my coaching and raising a kid out of it like no you're crazy (laughs) see I look at you and just think how do you do that how do you do that it's amazing I just ask myself what's the most important thing in any given moment and that's what leads my direction and 99% of the time it's Everett so he is with me and we're doing it together that is so beautiful letting that be okay and before I had him I would have everything had to be perfect I was like the perfectionist then you have a child and it's like that gets thrown out the window. Well, it has to. I don't know if it does for everyone, but it had to get thrown out the window for me because that was unrealistic. <laughs> yeah, it took me a little while to, to learn that. Like I was really slow to up on the uptake because I, when I couldn't make it perfect, I just tried harder mm-hmm. and so and harder and harder until I broke. And then when I realized, oh, hang on a minute, this is not not good and not healthy. Someone told me once I did a hospital stay, and she said to me, you know what? If you can just do a third of good parenting, mm-hmm. you're okay. So within your day, just a third of the day's good parenting mm-hmm. is good enough. Within the week, if you just do a third of the week in good parenting, the rest your child will love you regardless. If you give them toast for dinner, they're still going to be okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the term good parenting to me, it, like, oh, I don't know if that sits well. <laughs> like, our mm-hmm. job is to love and protect this little person. And so I think if we're loving and protecting that little person, that's good parenting, period. Like that's all yeah. we have to do. And yeah. I'm learning that as I'm going, because at yeah. first it's, you think that you're, you have to like, you're in charge of this little person. But what I'm learning and finding out is he's his own little person. <laughs> and I'm just here to just kind of push him along (laughs) and just protect him from getting hurt. And if I'm doing that and loving him, then that's the best I can do. And that's the best any mother can do. Exactly. Exactly. And one thing I did, I think it was a probably, I want to say maybe maybe seven months until my little girl actually really hurt her herself for the first time. She was in the care of my sister-in-law and she'd fallen over or something. I was like, 
how could you let that happen? Because I had protected her mm-hmm. for, and I like cotton wooled her for seven months. But she'd already had two kids that were older and she's like, it happens and it's going to happen more and it's okay. And it does. It, it, it does. When you start to just let go of your own expectations on you to be a superhuman and be everywhere every time, it, it, you do feel better. I do agree. The whole mom thing. It's like it comes with its own cape. It's invisible. <laughs> We do have to be the superhero. Definitely. Tell me about this book idea. What's your idea? What are you thinking? Oh, so this whole thing is kind of crazy. I have a little crazier story. So we talked about at the beginning of how me and you came to meet, like and came to like connect like this is I had posted something about my journey that I'm going through. And one of our people in our community says that I should write a book about this. And I wrote underneath that I'm not sure, I've never thought about this, I wouldn't even know where to begin, but I said, I'm open. And I swear the moment I said that you came under there and you said, I can help you with that. And then since then, it's been book, book, book everywhere. It's like people are coming in asking, like somebody (laughs) said to me that it's in the consciousness right now There's a book in the consciousness right now, and you're the one who's been chosen to write this book. And I'm like, so it's just been kind of crazy, actually, like magical crazy, not like. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Phenomenal. It's phenomenal, right? Yeah. And so so I am just open and I am here to like, give me all your wisdom. (laughs) Yeah. So do you have anything it it has, if you've got a picture in your mind about, is it is it a motherhood book? Is it a book about you, your journey? Is it a, what are you thinking? Like I said, the thought of writing a book before this whole, like yep. one person is planting it and plant, and it just keeps getting planted in my mind. Like the thought had never really crossed my mind. And I've been trying, like one day I just took the pen and like silenced my mind in meditation. And the moment I got out of meditation, I just started writing. And like all these words were just like pouring out of me, but it was like, talking about how my connection to the divine and how I found my connection to the divine. And so that's what I keep writing about. Like no matter like any meditation I've done and I've kind of let myself write, it's about how I like became one with the divine and how I feel so connected now and like how I'm seeing things so differently now and how I'm able to like disconnect and connect and it's just like a it's been a I don't even know how this happened really but I know I've been working on the journey to get here but so everything I've written about has been about like a divine connection it's just there's your book right there your book is (laughs) your book is actually oozing out of you without you even knowing and that is a gift you run with that that's what I mean like I know I asked that question a couple of different ways but it was the same question because it just came out just then that's your content there it is because you don't have a choice like you have been chosen you've been called Josie to write this and you in your meditations your hand is doing it for you now what you need is just someone who's walked the path before you I just got goose pimples like literally up and down my spine just now like and I wow. can see it on your face, like it's beaming from you. It's not something you're like, um, I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm going to write about. I just want to write. No, no, no. Like it's coming. I right? at write it me in the screen, and I can feel it. And I can almost, I'm almost picturing myself reading this oh my with your God. signed autograph to Steph. Here you go. <laughs> wow. So here's some things about book writing. Okay, I've written and published a book, but I never in my wildest dreams ever thought I'd be a writer because I was not actually that good at school. School wasn't my thing. It wasn't my jam. I just was there for socializing. So academically, English, maths, all of that was very mediocre and probably struggled at some point. But I always had a diary as a kid and always wrote in the diary. I couldn't spell to save my life. Like if I went back and read that now, like what does that even say? (laughs) I'm pretty sure there's an element of dyslexia in so many people who have trouble with spelling because they get letters and numbers mixed up. But so if you were to say to me, you will have a book when you're 40, I'm like, eh, no way. I'd have to get a ghostwriter. I'd have to get someone who's good at it. That all goes out the window because exactly what you just said 
it's in you. Like the book is in you. It doesn't, everything else will fall into place. That's why you get help, right? And so this is how my journey started. It was following the traumatic birth. I was involved in a lawsuit against the hospital where the birth happened. And during that process, my legal team said, stay off social media. You can't be on in that space because if there's anything you say it could be held against you. So I, I wasn't. But I, like I said to you just earlier, I had two kids under two. One morning they woke up and decided that they were going to paint my kitchen floor with a whole box of cornflakes and a jar of honey. It was everywhere. The <laughs> entire box was everywhere. And I'd come out from the bathroom and just went, oh, holy moly, what, what? And my husband was away for work and I was by myself and I couldn't cope. I couldn't cope physically with them. I couldn't cope mentally and emotionally. So I just started crying and I was like, I can't do this anymore. I guess too, around the same time, I was like, I used to use my phone just to get that mental break. So I'd play Tetris or I'd play some other stupid game. And I just happened to scroll through LinkedIn because I had a LinkedIn profile from my education profession. So I was just, just seeing what other people were doing. And I saw this post come up from a guy who I met years ago. He's an author and he's also a business coach. I think he's got 14 best-selling books now in marketing, wow. not my field at all. But I just saw these posts and he was panning a video in Bali of a beach. Mm. Like, oh, I like that. Where is that? I want to be there. I don't want to be here with my honey and cornflake floor. So I just clicked on it and I started reading. Take me away. He was doing an author's retreat. So you go and immerse yourself for a full five days in Bali mm. and you learn how to write a book. And I was like, oh, wow. Bali wasn't really a place I'd loved before. I mean, I was heartbroken when I went there the first time and I didn't want to be an author, but I still was called to go there. And this is one of those, like you just said, crazy, magical things that when my husband got home, he said, I, I told him, I said, I want to go to Bali. He's like, what? Why? When? And I want to go next week and I want to go write a book. And he was like, have you lost it? Have you lost the plot? How are we going to afford it? Who's going to look after the kids? Like all of these really genuine reasons why a mum just cannot lift her life and go to another country because she feels like it. I then said to him, just trust me on this. I don't know how to explain it to you. I actually don't have the words, but I'm, I can, I'm actually packing my bags in my head. <laughs> so what we did, Josie, in the next couple of days, we worked out childcare. And I was very lucky that my husband worked for an airline. So we were able to afford flights. I couldn't afford the course. What I will say is I reached out to this, this guy and said, I, I don't know how to say this. I really need to be there, but I can't afford it. And he said, it's okay. Just get here. We'll work it out. We will work it out. You can do a payment plan. If you pay me back as much as you can each month, we'll work it out. I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> wow. So there were so many reasons not to not go like I thought well yeah okay I've I've really I haven't really thought about this but I'm going anyway so I packed my bags and I left within a week I was in Bali and to the point where I arrived on the morning it started it, was, it started at 8 a.m and I think I got to Bali at midnight or one o'clock in the morning rocked up on the first day and said here I am don't want to write a book really I just all I really want to do is get all of this trauma from the past year and a half or two years out of my head into like a dear diary journaling. I'm going to write it. I'm going to lock it away. And then I'm going to get on with my life. So after day one, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk you through the things that we kind of learned so that they can help you in some really cool strategies. After day one, you have to go home and then start chapter one. By the time you leave Bali, chapter one is written and it's been reviewed and feedback so that when you get home, you finish the whole book. You don't just to go, oh, yeah, I did that thing and I never wrote the book. So many people do that. So many people have said to me, oh, I started a book in like 1968. It's like it's unfinished business. And so um, that night, Josie, when I went back to my room, I was by myself. I'd missed my kids. Oh, my God, the mother guilt, the guilt that I had left them with their dad, mind you, totally fine. But <laughs> 
just that I'd left them, I'd chosen something for me over them was really hard. And so I just, I started typing out a few things at the beginning of how it happened. And I can tell you that with every word, like there was just tears streaming from my face. And at that very point, I realized that I was carrying this big backpack of grief and loss from my childbirth and didn't even realize at the time because you're a new mom. You just get on with it. And it's really such a shift in your person that you don't have time to stop and think, wow, what just happened to me? You know, and I think just listening even to your own birthing story earlier, it sounded to me like it was something unexpected, quite traumatic at a point, Mm -hmm. scary. And you probably, I'm guessing, never had a chance to debrief on that. Mm -hmm. I yes, chose to good. debrief on that. Yes, I took, I got some help. Great. I'm so glad you said that. A lot of people don't know to do that. I didn't know to do that until I started writing this thing, this thing that was just going to be locked away. So that was night one. And then for the next week, I continued to learn how to write and improve and really basic stuff. Like that night I wrote, I think I started writing things, something like childbirth has been happening for centuries. And my feedback was, he said to me, would you sit down in a cafe and say to your friend, childbirth has been around for centuries? Like he said, no, you wouldn't. You would sit down and say, and I think I think I read, I actually wrote this, women have been having children for centuries, but yet nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. That's what we would say in a cafe. Hey, Josie, why are we having these experiences when we should be, you know, we should know better by now, right? So that was the key message I took away. Make it sound like you were chatting to your friend at the cafe because the person picking it up will want to read it in that way. They didn't want me to write a medical textbook or the history of childbirth. No one cares about that. They just want to know, hey, this really shitty thing happened and this is how, and this is how you can hopefully not let it happen to you. So that full entire immersion for the week was probably the catalyst to, for me, like you said, to go and get help when I got home. And it was also, I was so driven to then publish the book because in Bali, I was also introduced to the publisher. There was a publisher there and I worked with him and talked to him a lot. And I said, well, I don't think I want to publish this. I think it's too private. I think I'm not, I'm not one to normally do this type of stuff. And he said to me, he, he didn't have children. And he said, if you don't publish it, how are you going to make a difference to anyone in this world? It hit me straight to my heart. I'm like, I would actually feel really responsible for any other mum who suffered what I did because I knew and I didn't share it. I didn't help anyone. So then I was like, okay, done. Yep, right. I've got this. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm in. Probably, I want to say maybe three weeks after I got back from Bali, my husband turned to me and said, you took that lady to Bali and you brought my wife back. (laughs) So good. So I didn't need to have the words to explain to him why I needed to go because it just happened. (laughs) Oh. Yeah, I love that. Me too, because it was so true. It was so true that I, when I had come back, I was like, right, yes, I am getting myself some psychological help and I'm going to really try and resolve. So what happened was, in a really beautiful way, we pulled out of the lawsuit. When you deal with the legal system, it's really horrible, actually. When you're in the process, there is no good that comes of it. And I want to share that with people because I went in thinking, oh, great. The hospital are going to say sorry to me. Mm -hmm. They're going to admit that they were wrong. They're going to stop this from happening to anyone else if I sue them. When you realize that is never going to happen, the medical system's too big. They were just going to throw a bit of money at me. That was not my resolve. And that was not the point of starting a lawsuit. So we pulled out. And I mind you, we're left with a massive legal bill, like $10,000 for nothing. And I want to make that really clear because I think, unfortunately, I've seen it happen to other women in this birth trauma space. People think, oh, they're just money hungry. I've never met a woman in this birth trauma space that just wants money. They just want someone to say, we're sorry we did this to you. I know I went off a bit of a tangent. Oh, no. <laughs> Our listeners need to hear this. 
I think. And so I thought, well, if this book writing is making me feel better, my husband feeling like his wife is coming back, let's go on that path. Let's get to this T road and you see the legal road and it's very horrible and they were just going to really pull me to pieces. I didn't know if I had many pieces left to be pulled away. So we stopped it, copped the bill and went down this book path. What then happens is you have to write it. (laughs) It's totally fine to have chapter one in the can. And then when you get back from Bali, you have to write it. And what I do want to say is I am forever grateful that my husband is my team. So he and I are it. When I got home, so when I left to go to Bali, we just kind of moved into our house here. And there were boxes still everywhere. And we had this little room that was just, we just stored all the crap in there and shut the door. (laughs) door. When I got home, he had made an office, a little desk, and he'd put a photo in a frame of my kids on the desk. He'd set up the computer and said, this is where you're going to write. I'm like, oh my God, I loved it. I didn't care that I was around boxes and shelving. I just had this personal space where I could shut the door. And so everything really came together for me. And then I was like, right, I need to step into this. Your number one question is going to be, how the hell did you write a book with two kids under two? Here's my answer. And it's probably going to be in another book for me one day. It's called the 4 a.m. Writing Club. Mm -hmm. At 4 a.m. in the morning, you are the only person in that club. There is no one around. Everyone is sleeping. The birds are still sleeping. And this is how you do it. You go into your space, you put your headphones in, you turn off notifications in your computer, you do not log on to Facebook, you do not even open your phone to check for messages, you just go straight in your zone. And I like to put in like on YouTube, they've got study music, like literally Google study music, and they have this nice ambient white noise. And your fingers just pound, 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 pound for one hour only, then you have to stop. Because if you are writing a book that's highly emotional, if you keep going, your energy is going to be so drained Mm -hmm. that by the time your child wakes up at 5 a.m., like mine was a 5 a.m. riser, I'm like, go away. I can't deal. That was not going to be fair. So I knew that one hour of power, I called it, because if you give yourself those parameters, you're like, I've got to do my best stuff now. I can't be checking Facebook to see who liked my post. That doesn't really matter. You type. The next thing is you have to repeat that pattern every single day. You're going to be tired, but guess what, mama? You're tired anyway. You're Mm. a mom. By three o'clock, it wouldn't matter if you woke up at four o'clock, five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning. By three o'clock, you're tired anyway. Mm. So I thought, well, if I just did this, I can just have a snooze with the kids and be okay. Because you always got to look at the end goal. So to help you, and this is something that they they didn't teach me in the course. I learned so much amazing stuff, but this is one thing they didn't teach me. That the next day, so you do day one, you come back into your space. It's really important that you do this. In Word document, there's a little thing at the top where it's a microphone and it plays what you have written back to you. So step one is you tune in and you listen to what you wrote the day before for three minutes or however long it takes, whatever the paragraph is, and then you go straight into typing. The reason why you do that is because it gives you your headspace and your voice of where you were because otherwise you might be a bit disjointed, like you might not know, oh, what did I say? And then you have to go back and reread it. But if you hear it and you hear the passion, the better, I think. And you hear the message, oh, that's what I was, that's not what I meant. What was that? Was I, was I even awake? <laughs> and you can go back and fix it, right? But, but actually, no, you don't even fix anything. You just do that. Type and type and type every day. I actually never, it got to the point, Josie, I didn't want to take a day off mm. on the weekend. I thought, oh, maybe I'll have a sleep in on the weekend. <laughs> I found that by three weeks, you know, 21 days to build that habit. I was like, I didn't need my alarm. I woke up and I was like, right, let's go, let's go. The night before I would set up my tea at the kettle. So all I had to do was pour it, come straight in and sit and go. By the time it got to, you know, 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., I was like, oh, I'm good. I feel really good now. I've gotten rid of this, this really horrible thoughts and feelings in my body. It was really therapeutic. And they say it's cathartic to write a book. 
I totally agree with mm. that. You probably feel that when you journal, right? Mm-hmm. You're like reading my mind because I'm because <laughs> all the things I'm thinking, you're like already ahead of one step ahead of me. And <laughs> yes, it is so cathartic. So that's what I was gonna say, pen to paper. So I it flows out of me, but the moment I get to typing, nothing happens. Right. Here's another option for you then. Pull out your phone on voice memos and say it. Just say it out loud. It's sometimes just by saying it and then you can probably type it. Sometimes I think we overthink it Mm -hmm. when we get to the keyboard. The reason why I want you just to dump it all out, it will make no sense at times. You're like, what was that gobbledygook? Because that's the next phase. You just have to get it out first. And the next phase is editing. And so that you leave that for then and you know that's coming and you know it's going to come together. But I do want to jump back one step. This is one thing I did learn in the course and I'm pretty sure I can share this with you. I'll, I'll definitely get permission. But you also need to structure a basic outline of what you're thinking. Before you write the book? You can, yeah, because guess what? So this is how I did it. This is really helpful. Mm. These beautiful little gems, mm. post-it notes. Post-it. Okay, because I think if, if, if what I'm hearing is that, you know, you, before becoming a mom, you like to have things perfect, to write down the chapters on a piece of paper would annoy you because if it didn't turn out that way, you'd like, hey, I didn't get that right. These post-its are amazing. So what you do is you line up post-its at the top, across the top, and then down the bottom, and you just start putting, I mean, if, you, if the words flow for you out of a pen, mm-hmm. start writing them on here and not sentences, but just words like divine connection, whatever happened to you and how this happened. Like, I can't believe this is happening. It sounds crazy <laughs> because yes. I'm pretty sure one of your chapters in your book might say, and I felt like I was a bit crazy that this doesn't sound normal, right? I think you should have just. girl? Yeah. <laughs> because people will be asking that and if you call it call the elephant in the room so just write what you think the chapter Mm. might be about then stick them on the wall you can move them you can throw them out you can replace them like it just gets you out of that perfectionist mindset Mm -hmm. and you're really flexible I still have my book outline of post-its on a big piece of paper because I wanted to keep it but they changed so much. I'm like, oh, we never did write about that. Did I forget that? I'm like, oh, no, actually, I made the decision. It wasn't, wasn't for this book, wasn't for this version at the time. So if you just have that outline there and then you start to da 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 and then you add things as you go and you'll take things out. So once you have what you think is done, you'll know. I think you'll know. And it's funny because I didn't. I didn't cover things that I wrote in those post-its and I thought, oh, maybe I should go back and do that. And then something in my gut that said, no, but you've written the last sentence already. You don't need that. And that last sentence was about taking action. Like, what are we going to do now? We've got to be brave and do this. You sound like you're already super in tune Mm -hmm. to your body and your mind. You will know when it's the end, right? What are you going to do next? I'll say this. I don't think anyone can edit their own book. You might have an auntie or a mom or an uncle or someone who's good at proofreading for spelling, grammar, great. (laughs) But this is where I think it would make a difference between a book for you. I mean, a lot of people um, publish books on Amazon because it's just something that they want to write and do. The difference between writing a book for you like a dear diary and getting it to publishing where people will buy in a bookstore is your editor. And investing in paying for a proper book editor is really important. My publisher said this to me, and at first, I'll see how you react. (laughs) I was horrified. He said the difference between the book you want to sell and the book you've written is a good editor. And I was like, what? Is my book not good? Did I not write? He's like, no, 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 no. The book that goes on the shelf the editor gives you so much feedback on so you just make it better and better and better on what you already have. It just made me think about same thing as a like a cosmetology educator. So I just was thinking about picturing that head of hair that somebody does at home versus paying that $400, $500 to get it perfect. Like you, you need a second, you need an eye. Correct. And you need someone who's not attached to you. 
because the people in your circle love you so much. They won't say to you the things that an editor can say to you. Like, this makes no sense. You know, if someone you love says that to you, like, why? What? Yeah. What's wrong? You know, and you get really upset and it hurts. From an editor's perspective, a good editor will say, I th- are you actually trying to say this? And they'll rewrite the paragraph for you. Like, I think you're trying to say this is this close is this more what you're trying to say and you're like oh yeah yeah oh that sounds heaps better (laughs) to the point where I could look at my book and not know which part was the editor and which part was me I'm like oh that sounds really good and I'm like did I write that or did they you know and I think that's part of it like for example I, I was really adamant of working with a female editor as you can imagine talking about vaginas it was really important she also had experience in this pelvic health space, which was great. But she suggested to me, why don't you add some questions at the end of each chapter to let people reflect? So the story is not just about you and your journey. It also helps them. So that's what a good editor does. I never had thought of that on my own. I'd love to claim that I did (laughs) because I love those questions. I think they're so good. And now I go back and read them and I'm like, that was the best idea. That's what an editor does. This is the job of a really good editor, right? So once you go through that process, I will say that takes probably just as long as it does to write the book because you have to go back and you have to look at it and you have to reread it. And at some point you can get tired of it. Mm. Like, (laughs) oh, I've done this. (laughs) That's when you have to pull you in your grit and you have to pull in your nest and say, I'm nearly there. I'm so close now. Once you do that editing process, you then have to read it again and again and again and sit. You know, I sat at a cafe with a printed version highlighting things that I had to go back. I think the biggest moment for me, Josie, was I like that suggestion I said about hearing it back each chapter. I actually listened to the book from the start to the finish. I think it took five hours one day. And I sat back in my chair and I was like, holy moly, that poor girl, that's just hard. It was a total out-of-body experience. And I had to realize like, oh, shit, that was me. That's Mm. me. And then you open a whole other chapter, I say, on healing. You're like, Mm -hmm. you've got to help this girl, this poor girl. What, what, What am I doing for myself? And the answer was at that time, very little some psychology sessions and that was it. So I think it was really just the start of the healing journey, which is great. Here's the hard part. This is the part you might not, you might want to tune out for. <laughs> if you are wanting to get your book on a bookshelf in a store, you have to pay a proper publisher. And in Australia, self-publishing is more of a, it's becoming more acceptable because they actually really prefer traditionally like publishing houses that pay you to write a book that's like a real author I don't know if it's the same in the states I don't know so to me I had that stigma of going well I'll take it to a publishing house and I will show them the manuscript and then they can see if they like it or not the title was never going to get through a publishing house the word vagina on the front cover of a book scared men and Who sits at the top of these publishing houses? Men. It was too risky for them. Although you could go to a bookshop and see, what's that book called? How to Not Give an Mm -hmm. F-U-C-K. That was fine. A man could write a book about that. But a woman writing a book about a vagina? No. So I had to make the really hard decision to self-publish because I, if I changed the title, if I said the day my pelvic floor broke, the day I had a birth trauma, I don't think we'd be talking about this right now. It would have been something that sat on the bottom of the bookshelf and that was it. So I had to be really brave and go, right, okay, I'm going to self-publish. And I did that. But self-publish here in Australia basically just means you have a professional editor, you get it professionally designed, you have someone who designs the cover, the layout, everything is done for you, but you have to pay for it. Two kids under two couldn't really afford barley on a payment plan. How the heck do you afford a publishing, publish your book? So the, this was the hard part. I had to crowdfund. And, um, you know, crowdfunding is one of those things. 
that was very new to me. I'd never done it before. I'd never asked anyone for a cent in my life. Like I'm such a financially staunchly independent woman and have been forever that to ask people for that was probably the hardest part actually. So in exchange, this is what I did. I'm like, I've got to feel better about this. I found a really, so, you know, you've heard of GoFundMe. Yes. And and Kickstarter and all of those things. I was like, I don't want people to fund me. I just want to do some good in the world. So I found this crowdsourcing company called Start Some Good. Like, I like that because I'm going to start some good here and I want people to come along. So I applied. You have to actually apply to be with them, which made me feel like, hey, that's really cool because you're not just going to take any old person who's trying to get money. And the one thing about I loved about them is if you don't reach your target, you don't take anything. You get nothing. And that to me oh, wow. really, yeah, my credibility. I was like, I love that because I don't want something. If I can't finish this project and produce this book, I want nothing. And so I was like, I align with that. That's amazing. I went with them and they, they guided me through this campaign. That was really hard. So what I did was I came up with a whole lot of things. I'm like, well, you can just order a copy of the book early. I'm just going to charge you what I would in a bookshop. Mm-hmm. The retail, $29.95, plus a little bit of postage. A lot of people took that up because they were going to get something. Mm-hmm. Your family and friends who want to support you, like, yeah, I can do that. Even if I never read it. <laughs> totally fine. So that was amazing. And then I had some other, you know, we could do some marketing partnerships and stuff, some big ones. And some companies took it on. It was just, like you said, Mm -hmm. when you wrote the words, I'm open, Mm -hmm. they come. When you put an offering of like, would you like to work with me on another level? People came and said, yeah, I'd love to. I'm like, it blew my mind. Like I just, having the faith and then doing it is the next thing. Mm -hmm. So then we we reached our target. So I was really close. I think it was a Saturday morning and I thought, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it today. And I was really upset. I was like, what are we going to do? And you can't add your own money, which I also love because I thought maybe we could try and borrow money off my parents or something, Mm -hmm. you know, just to get over the line. But you, you legally can't do that. And I'm like, okay. My husband said, just go to yoga. Just go like I was really kind of in a bad headspace. At the end of the session, I opened my phone and we'd reached the target Mm -hmm. because one man, one man got me over the line with the last couple of thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. I just cried. I just cried and cried. I actually cried really hard because that was to ask people for that was really hard. But then I could deliver and then I could give and it was so exciting and it was amazing. We had the most amazing book launch party, you have to make sure you've got a party Josie booked. You have to celebrate all those 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. wake-ups, the sacrifices you're going to make for your family to, to do this and the heart you're going to give it. You've got to have a party to celebrate. And then, then amazing things come when you write a book. So many opportunities and so many conversations just like right now that you don't think you're going to have. Like I would never have a podcast had I not written this book, had I not gone to Bali and just there was a lot of big leaps of faith there. You've heard them. You're nodding. Yes. (laughs) My gosh, so good. All of it's so good. I had chills, that story, all of it. So good. Oh, (laughs) I want to unpack what you said about receiving because I know for women that is like, that's the biggest thing. Like yes. we can give all day long, but the moment it's time to, for us to open our hands to receive, it becomes like, but is it too much? But why? We want to push that offer away of being able to receive. So how did you allow yourself? Cause I know you said you found ways to make it feel good for you, but even with that, you still had to, it had to be work. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. I don't know if it was just because we were in the fog of busyness in the house and there's so much going on that you just don't have too much time like you think about it like how can I do this well here's a tip actually (laughs) I like to do this in so many elements of my life but this is helpful my best friend taught me this one song it's called so if you are feeling something if you're feeling guilt if you're feeling if you're struggling with a thought put on one song in your in your ear for, for five because what are they like generally five minutes mm-hmm. or less give, yeah yeah give yourself permission to feel anger pain hurt fear 
you can't do it, you're not good enough, why would people do this, why would they accept you, for one song. Mm-hmm. When that song is over, you're like, right, okay, I'm done. Mm-hmm. You move on. And you can do it every day if you need to. You can put on another song. Like there's no, there's no hard rule. Basically what you're saying is it's okay. I'm going to feel this for the next four minutes. Let it out. Cry if you need to. Laugh, whatever. But then you've got to get on with your day mm-hmm. because otherwise you get stuck. You get mm-hmm. stuck in that hole of really, and it, it can be quite um, deep spiral mm-hmm. very quickly for some people. Allow yourself in it and then help yourself get out of it. That's exactly it. You have to acknowledge it and you have to, I always say it's like that child that's pulling at your leg. It's like, I'm here, I'm here, pay attention to me. And until you pay attention to the emotion, it's just going to keep coming back. And so I love that you said, put on a song, let yourself feel it and allow yourself to be completely in it. But then after that song is over, it's time to move on. I've never heard of that before. And I love that practice. It's beautiful. And the one thing I think is like, when we open our hands to receive, because how you finished that sentence was that I was able to give. So it's like a two-way street. You have to receive in order to give. You cannot, you cannot just keep giving. Yeah, that's so true. And if you think about all the things that had to happen, that beautiful man, Andrew Griffiths, his name is, who gave me the opportunity to pay him back over a period of time. He didn't have to do that. I didn't know he would even offer that. But I just said, I just, I actually opened up and said, I can't afford this. He's like, it's okay. We'll work it out. I I never expected him to say that. I never expected anything for free, but I never expected him to say, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, like that, that's the giving and receiving. It's not literally giving something. It's just giving space to Mm -hmm. say, it's going to be okay. Had he not done that, we wouldn't be here doing this right now. <laughs> Amazing. I'm forever grateful for that man. I really am. And he's, he's a mentor. We still connected. And his favorite photo is still holding my book because it is really out there for an author of marketing to hold a vagina book. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes. Mm. Oh, all of it. Like my heart is so full right now. I feel, oh my gosh, so much love for you. So much love for this connection. And you can start there's writing so today. much synchronicities here. Like, <laughs> like if I were to tell you, I was called to Bali myself, like literally called to Bali. Oh, what? What? <laughs> tell me what happened. I was called to Bali. I was teaching at the Aveda Institute. I was helping these molding these young minds. And I don't even know, same thing, scrolling (laughs) social media. There it is. All of a sudden, the next thing I know, I'm telling my husband, I'm going to Bali. And he's like, what? You're crazy. (laughs) I made it. I made it to Bali, had this whole awakening and had this whole like shift of like being guided like this. <laughs> this is unbelievable. People listening to this are going, are these two for real? But oh my gosh, it is a healing place, isn't it? I was so- forever changed, forever healed. I was supposed to be there. And I went, when I go in, I go all in. I'm kind of like a yeah, I love it. balls to the wall kind of girl. So I was like, I'm going to Bali for 30 days because that's as long as the visa <gasps> will allow. And when I got there, I loved it so much. And it was so healing that I spent another 30 days. I had 60 full days in the island of the gods and I was forever I'm forever changed oh so the fact God. that you were telling that story I was just like wow the secreticities now um, I know why secrets out Bali everybody and truly <laughs> like so like I said the first time I went there was for a holiday and I felt really wrong because we were living in this luxury place and treated like kings and queens but the people outside were starving and that's why I didn't like it I thought it was a beautiful place but the disconnect between my feeling of I can't be in here eating prawns and having cocktails and I can see kids outside hungry the second time I went I went to a totally different place where the Balinese people actually holiday Mm -hmm. with us and I was very grateful for that experience because Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was so, and I'm not a healing believer, Chris Silly person, but I bought back stuff from there that I just love and cherish. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, now it really, it just changes you. Mm -hmm. It really does. does. 
It's next level. It's next, next level. And really? there's guest houses where you actually get to stay with the families. And yeah. that was the route I took was like yeah. staying with the families and being a part of the culture. And there's ways of doing it where you're in a yeah. resort, but it's different. So there's just, oh, it has Do you know what? forever. We should say, Josie, we know Kathy's going to listen to our episode right now. She should just have her next retreat there. Thank you, Kathy. Yep. I'm there. <laughs> Let's go. I'm booked. <laughs> I can't make it all the way to LA, but I certainly could go to Bali tomorrow. Oh, I just, I'm so grateful for this. And I'm so grateful for to chat with you today because I just, I knew that there was, when I, it's funny when we used to do the weekly calls and I saw your son, I knew that there was a connection there. I just didn't know because he's so beautiful. But just seeing you two and seeing you hold him to sleep, I was always in awe because I couldn't hold my kids with prolapse. I, unless I was sitting down, I didn't get that. And so I used to watch you in, like in, in admiration, I think. Mm. And so I knew that there was something. And now look at us. We have been on these like parallel university journeys. Josie, this is so cool. It feels so guided and it feels so good to know that this message is going to get out there. And not only is this message going to get out there, but now I'm going to write a book. You are. You are good. I, I want you to have, oh, where is it? So on day two, we rock up into the room where this, we, and you've got to create a beautiful space. We were in an art gallery learning how to write a book. It was mm. with local Balinese artwork. I loved it. You, I walked in that day and on the desk, Andrew had made for us those Balinese wooden carvings that said Steph Thompson dash author. Mm. I'm like, oh my God, he thinks I'm an author. You need something like that to remind yourself you are an author. You are going to write the most amazing story. I want to be the first person to read it. <laughs> oh my and gosh. This is, and this is right. This is, this is the last tip I'll leave you with. Just like your podcast, some people will love your book and some people it won't be for them. And that's okay because that's them, Absolutely. right? Writing the book is for you. I wrote this book for me and I'm okay to say that because by writing it for me and my daughter, it will help others. And if it doesn't and it's not someone's jam, they are more than welcome to close it and gift it to someone else because at the very beginning of this book, I've got written in there, this journey began with, and you write your name, and then it says, and now the knowledge is within you, pass it on to someone else. I don't want people to keep it. I want them to share it, give it to someone, give it away. That's what oh, you can do with your book. So good. And I lo love it because it's not just about the book. It's about life in general. Like some people are going to be your people. And some people are not going to be your people. And we have to allow that to be okay. But yeah. even in motherhood, there's such a competition to be that good mom. Like we were talking about that conversation earlier, like to be that good mom who has it all together and who looks perfect on Instagram. Yeah. And what you just said, like there's going to be your people and there's going to be not. So like be you and do it for yeah. you. And if we, even if you were to take that in all areas of our lives, be oh. you do it Would for be. you like yeah do you feel right that that is happening more and more for you since being in this container I've never been more in love with myself than I have at 41 even with the cold sore on my face I don't care in the past I would have tried to cover up I would have done this that and the other and I'm like no this is me I've never felt so good in my skin since starting this course I'm so proud of that for me because I've always been so self-conscious how you look, how you dress, how you be. And I think all of that noise potentially probably didn't make me a really nice person. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like I can be a really nice person to others because I'm being nice to myself. Yes, fill your cup and pour from the overflow. Yes, yeah. that's my message to the world. Like literally just keep filling yourself up until you have so much to give that you can't help but just give it away. Yeah. I know right now that, I can hear my kids have woken up. I want to give them so much because you have given me so much today. I'm really thankful for that because I can't wait to hug them now. Mm. And you don't normally wake up like that when we've only had like four hours sleep because of, you know, the kids were up in the night. But now I'm like, I am overflowing. Thank you, Josie. <laughs> oh, 
thank you for this. And thank you for making the time and the space. And oh, I want you to share you. where the listeners can support you, where they can buy your book, all of it, because we want sure. to celebrate you, celebrate the fact that you put this book out in the world. And I know it was from your heart because as you were speaking, I, I felt it. And I, I know that, that everybody's going to feel that too. I do hope so. I really do. So first of all, I made sure that we purchased ourselves a massive stack of these books that go in public libraries in Australia. You can go to your public library and borrow it because this information isn't for the rich who can afford a $30 book. It's for everyone. We also created an audio book for people who can't read. You can listen to it. So I just wanted to make it accessible wherever I can. And I hope my big hope one day, two things, my two big hopes, Number one, it's made in multiple languages. Number two, I write the sequel that says the day my vagina was fixed Mm. because I want, I am on this journey to find better. I can't live like this forever. It's really hard. But now that's my thing. So there are two big things. Obviously, to write a book like this, like I said to you, it takes a whole lot of vulnerability. And so I created a brave mama community because I'm a mom and I had to be brave. I had to, to put that on the front cover. And so now I have this amazing community of women from around the globe who also have pelvic organ prolapse it's a very private space I'm very protective we do a very very thorough vetting process but then we also have a brave on my website we have the podcast it's available to everyone accessible to everyone so that's where you can find us yeah I just love you so much <laughs> Thank Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for being you. Thank you for your vulnerability and openness and willingness to share everything you've shared with us today, with me today. Like I'm forever touched. Thank you so much for listening to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so filled with joy to have you here. If this show resonates with you, I have a gift for you. If you're feeling stuck, this freebie may be just what you need. I believe that if you know your why, it helps you get unstuck quicker. So to connect with your heart and know your why and figure out what it is that is most important to you, get the freebie. It's in the show notes. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notifications each week. To support the show, you're invited to leave a tip in the tip jar. Information for all this is in the show notes. Sending love and light to the spirit listening to this today. Be blessed.